wow, what an episode. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to work out what to say because what, what I've found out from uh, William this time is science has a terrible memory. Boiling food almost always doesn't work better. Fast boats are bad. Delicious, delicious penguin meat. Now, now, I never thought about a penguin steak before, but now we finished recording and I'm thinking all I want is a penguin steak. And basically, there's nothing about scurvy that isn't entirely fascinating and also a little bit, I don't know, sad making? Let's call it disappointing. It must have stung. I mean, physically, of course, it was... uh... It would have been painful. They were they were exhausted. They were starving. Their bodies were wasting, and they had wounds that uh, just wouldn't heal. So you've just listed a whole bunch of stuff. Stinging is probably the bottom of my list of concerns. <laughs> with the list of stuff. Like that. Uh, well, yeah. So there would have been that physical stinging, but mm. I think there would have been a mental, a mental sting, a bit of a moral injury as well. Okay. You see. As Captain Robert Falcon Scott lay dying in his frozen tent in the middle of Antarctic wasteland in 1912. But haven't you told me this one? And it's another <laughs> bit of it. It's another bit of it. Yeah. He would have known that some of the symptoms he was seeing in his team had a consistent pattern. Okay. So beyond the starvation and the cold and the frostbite, he knew- <sighs> Which, can I ask, all consistent as well? <laughs> no, they're, they're not part of it. They're other. Oh, okay, they're okay, other. Okay, no, but he knew, that, he knew that the exhaustion- the physical wasting, mm. the wounds that wouldn't heal. Mm-hmm. They oh, also nostalgic thoughts of home. Um, yeah, well, that stings. Were all symptoms of a disease that had killed millions of people over the last few centuries. Yeah, and you know, of course, he and his men they didn't want to join the millions to die of that. So oh, of that, I was going to say because they're going to join them. Eventually. But that isn't why I reckon it would have stung. Right, I reckon it would have stung because he would have known that. Over a hundred years earlier, they'd cured, cured that disease. Right. His employers, in fact, the people he was working for, had developed a cure that was nearly a hundred percent working. Oh, and there he was in the Antarctic it wasteland. Ivermectin. Not that. <laughs> dying of something previously had been cured. Ah, so measles. What was it? What was this this condition? It was known as the scourge of the seas, or the end of the explorers. Yeah. The topic of today. Good old fashioned scurvy. Welcome to the Wholesome Show. A podcast that gets lost in the whole of science. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. And me, not Will Grant. So I'm going to tell you a story today. Mm. It's uh, the thing that gets me about this. Scurvy, as I'll tell you in a bit, is a horrendous disease. Oh. Horrendous. <laughs> like, you come to that uh. and killed shockingly, yeah. shockingly high numbers of people. Yeah. Um, turns out, not the hardest thing in the world to stop. Um, but the, it just blows my mind. Rum. That uh, we had cures for it. We worked out a cure. And then we lost it. Do you know why? Because it only affects people at sea. You don't need to do <laughs> Not it. true. On frozen water, it doesn't affect you. Just a quick note on some of the sources. Um, so there's a couple of, couple of um, uh, great articles that we're drawing on for this one. Mm. So there's Jeremy Hugh Barron's article in Nutrition Reviews. Uh, oh, no, I've read that one. Don't ruin it for me. No, <laughs> I, I won't tell you everything. Really. Sailor's scurvy before and after James Lind, reassessment. And also Mace uh, Ciglowski's Idle Words post, Scott and Survey. Scurvy. So Scott and Survey. Scott and Scurvy. Sur- and scurvy. Surveys will kill you. Yep. So Scurvy's plagued humanity for as long as we've been farming, basically. Uh, as long as we've been farming? Yes. It's it's weirdly, it's one of the first lifestyle diseases that we got. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a second. But uh, we didn't have scurvy uh, when we were hunter-gatherers. And then- Is that because the records were kind of sketchy? No, uh, yes, the records were <laughs> sketchy, but we can dig up skeletons and stuff like that. And there's oh, no yeah. evidence of scurvy in any hunter-gatherer populations, but we can find evidence of scurvy um, in ancient uh, agricultural societies. 
Okay, monocropping and specialization and shit. Mm, maybe something like that. Something like that. Maybe something like that. Yeah, okay. Um, there's ancient writings as well. There's a, there's a, a papyrus scroll, mm. which is from 1500 BC. So what is that? A while ago. Yeah. <laughs> from yonts. Uh, talking about scurvy. Yeah. Uh, an Indian scientist named um, Susruta uh, from 600 BC. Uh, Pliny the Elder. Oh. Pliny the Elder? Pliny the Elder? Pliny. Pliné the Elder. Why not? Uh, he, he talked about scurvy in the Roman army in, Did he? in Germany. Uh, so there you go. Not just on the water. Um, but Scott did not know that. He didn't know that. Uh, actually, um, for a long time, and I'll come to this a little bit later, uh, people didn't know that land scurvy and sea scurvy, they didn't call them both scurvy, no. uh, were the same thing. They, they didn't connect them at all. It, is it because the symptoms are exactly the same? <laughs> That's what didn't give it away. <laughs> Hang on. The symptoms are, are remarkably specific as well. So it's, uh, yes. it's weird that they didn't notice yes. that. It's weird. Again, a, a learned gentleman it, came in and went, no, these people are on boats. Boat, these people. Boat scurvy. Not on boats. It took a while to work that one out. I don't know why. I don't know why. No theories. Um, yeah, there's there's a Chinese monk who talked about it in the 5th century mm. and and um, someone in the 13th century talking about the crusade. So, so scurvy's been known about for, yep. for a long time. Now, before we keep going, you want to know what scurvy is like. I course. really do. I've only heard snippets, but what I want now, and do not stop. I want every single detail, <laughs> everyone. If I'm not gagging by the end of this, you have failed. It's like all diseases that, <laughs> that we explore on The Wholesome Show. Uh, it was horrible and gross. Excellent. And painful yep. and deadly and, and killed a lot of people. So And, and stingy. And stingy. Uh, normally starts, you get a little bit, a little bit tired. Lethargy and malaise. So you feel a little bit, uh, you haven't got as much energy. You're a little bit sleepy poo. I, I feel that now. Uh, you start to get a little bit sore and a little bit short of breath. Yeah. And then Tick. in particular, you start to get sore around the gums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, then your legs become dark, either purple or blue or red. Uh, and there's st stains or spots all over them. So it turns into what looks like a giant bruise or you get these black welts all over your legs. Oh, fuck. Then your muscles start wasting away. So uh, people become feeble and weak, um, scarce not able to move their bodies. Do we have a timeline on this or is that coming? Uh, That's over a period of... So mm, it's yeah. it normally starts, it can start quite quickly, but it can start about three months after your, your voyage to sea or something like that. So it, three takes, months. So it takes a while before you happen, right. but then you can collapse quite quickly over mm. a few days in, in those moments. They start hallucinating. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, At least some of it's fun. This is when they develop a heightened, yes, no, heightened sense of nostalgia and marvellous aesthetic experience of the world. Uh, someone called it an intense pleasure taking in, taken in textures, shapes, and colours. This is a TV disease. <laughs> like the goodies used to do it. You know, if you go down here, you get this weird disease, you jump in the air, you shit yourself, you cry once, you fall over, burp, and then you die, and they all go through it. Tick, 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 and this is yeah. the same. Yeah. Uh, there's a moment where you love the whole world or something like this. They do. They do. There, There is weird uh, – Weird moments of, of hallucination, nostalgia that seem quite loving. Um, some that they're often also definitely having negative feelings as well. Come to that. But nostalgia is a biochemical reaction. It's very unusual. I, it's not now, but or I not? Uh, no, no. As in, um, when people were first discussing nostalgia, yeah. they thought of it mostly as a biochemical or as a disease. Uh, Are you being nostalgic about nostalgia discussions now? No. <laughs> Back when people used to discuss nostalgia. But, but they yeah, did they think went, about it as a disease. Um, well, you know, the, we've moved on. Super vivid dreams of food. Not shocking. but uh, at, at sea, though, again, I'm not, or even Scott of the Antarctic, I gather food became an issue. It's not a surprise. No. It's not a surprise. So there'd be people, um, whilst they, some of the hallucinations were uh, potentially, I won't call them upbeat, but a little bit. <laughs> How would you describe the symptoms? <laughs> Fairly upbeat, really. No, I mean, most of the time, tell, tell most of the time, boils. intense and hor hor horrifying uh. pain. Uh, but they, someone described it as a falling down of the whole soul. Uh, there are numerous accounts of hardened naval officers uh, uh. just sitting down and crying because the food they had expected to find that they'd hallucinated wasn't there. Oh, so, so it's the cartoon, that thing turns into a chicken, then you grab it and it's still just a cup. Literally, literally. Okay. So it seems like these people out on these sea voyages yeah. are starting to get the scurvy. They're imagining <laughs> the delicious bowl of food that they want and then it disappears. It's a bag of nails. <laughs> it's a bag of nails. This is not muesli. So your gums get worse and worse and mm. worse. Mm-hmm. 
I'll, I'll read you a story about how bad they get in a second. I've heard hint. That's that's one I've heard the most about. Yeah, not not detail. Just like apparently your, your gum, your teeth going loose and and further. Teeth go loose. Teeth yeah. fall out. So you, you, you all your teeth fall out. Old wounds open up. Uh, Emotional. Everything starts to stink. Like in, in in all of the all of the records I've got of this, they describe it as an unholy stink. Oh, like it was fuck just me. feral. They said it's like you're rotting from the inside. Oh. And and this is in an era when everything stank. You know, everything. Yeah, stank. and everyone was rotting from the inside. I mean, this is what they did. This is just a more exotic form of internal rottage. This is special rotting from oh, no. the inside. You've worked hard for this. You sailed the seven seas. You've gone to the Antarctic, Arctic, a- Antarctic, both both places. Scott of both Tarctics. Uh, their breath, a filthy savour. Uh, one chaplain. Oh um, God. One chaplain blamed the particular stink on what he considered the most revolting aspect mm-hmm. of scurvy, mm-hmm. a strange plethora of gum tissue sprouting out of the mouth. Oh, the bits of your gums fall off. Well, so they sort of grow out of your mouth, which immediately <sighs> rotted and lent the victim's breath an abominable odour. Mm. It, well, look, it would take your mind off your teeth falling out, right? Think about you're gonna be okay. Do, do you want to have a lie down? <laughs> it grosses me out so much. Oh. I can't stand it when you're sitting next to someone at a conference and they've got over and a strong got, coffee breath or rotten gum breath. Yeah. Well, you get that too. I mean, obviously, it's pretty much 50 50 in the kind of conferences I've been to, but the, the, the deep coffee breath when someone clearly has drank nothing but coffee, they're probably hung over from the conference dinner. Not beautiful. And they, they lean in to whisper and they go, Have you thought about blowing? I'm like, Ah. <laughs> Why are you thinking specifically conferences? There There's are many, something about them, though. There are many times and places where people have gross breath. But it's something about conferences. <laughs> God. Uh, anyway, the, that sounds – this one sounds worse. Worse than conference breath. Apparently, uh, towards the end, their bodies would start creaking and rattling mm-hmm. uh, because all of the connective tissue mm-hmm. um, inside had dissolved – and so their bones and their organs would just sort of rattle and jingle against each other. This is a cartoon disease. <laughs> this is entirely a cartoon <laughs> disease. I mean, honestly, all I can see in my head now is animations. <laughs> it could be a symptom of scurvy as well, so, to be fair. So imagine a boat full of people. Rattling. All just stinking like <laughs> dead everything. <laughs> stinking and rattling. We'll sneak up on them. Clack it, clack it, clack it. Great. So here's a survivor account written by an English surgeon in the 16th century. Upbeat. It rotted all my gums, which gave out a black and putrid blood. Mm. My thighs and lower legs were black and gangrenous, Mm -hmm. and I was forced to use my knife each day to cut into the flesh in order to release this black and flat, foul blood. I also used my knife on my gums, Mm -hmm. which were livid and growing over my teeth. What are you doing? I'm cutting away the excess gum tissue that grew overnight. Sorry about the smell. (laughs) When I cut away this dead flesh and caused much black blood to flow, mm-hmm. I rinsed my mouth out and mouth and teeth with my urine. Rubbing- yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. And you know, when you're looking forward to the urine rinse, things aren't going well. How was the trip? Oh, I was a bit shit. <laughs> what was the highlight? <laughs> Rinsing my mouth with my own piddle. Well, he rubbed them very hard with, his, with his urine rinse. Of course, yeah. And the unfortunate thing was that I could not eat. Des- that was the unfortunate thing. Couldn't eat. Yeah. Desiring more to swallow than chew. Many of our people died of it every day, yeah. and we saw bodies thrown into the sea constantly, three or four at a time. Apparently, towards the end, and, and they got very, very weak. You know, the, the stereotypical image, um, there's plenty of paintings and drawings of this, yep. is just like people that are pre-corpse, basically. Yeah, I think I've seen that actual painting that you've got there. Th- yep. that, that looks familiar. Yeah, it's they're, they're basically pre corpses yep. lying in lying in the bowels of these ships, and they're just on the way to dying. Yeah, but apparently they became so weak that if they exert themselves in any way, they were apt to swoon and die immediately, or rattle to death. Well, <laughs> well, apparently some would be killed when a gunshot went off, like just the sound of the gunshot and or the per- shock. Percussive, oh no, that like heart attack and joint explosion, or something. Heart attack, joint explosion. They just f- fell apart. Ah, oh, fucked up. This is why I don't go on cruises. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're that and everything else about a cruise, but yeah. So as I said before, scurvy's been around since uh, since agricultural times and people have talked about it in plenty of different centuries, but it's really, it's one of the diseases that sort of boomed with the age of the explorers. It, I've got to say, on the symptoms, because they're wonderful. Yeah. Something that makes your 
teeth loosen and fall out to me is a definition of I'm so royally fucked right now. Whatever it is, whether it's scurvy or whatever, that to me is one of the most horrifying things. And I mean your joints, you're stinking, your black blood, your legs going purple and dancing on their own, whatever. But feeling your teeth loosen and then they start to drop out. To I me, know. that's just all post-apocalyptic oh, radiation yeah. nightmare. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Loosen teeth. Your, your body is disintegrating before yeah. your eyes. You know yeah. what is so weird yeah. is that um, – the the known cures for scurvy now, um, really quite simple. Gunpowder? Uh, not that. Push-ups? Not, <laughs> not that. Reading. But people would rec- recover super quickly. Yeah. Like I don't know from what point. Like I, I don't think if, if gunshot can kill you, then you get a, a cure. And that but tomorrow you have a little. Yes. And, and it and could look, be. Most people know what the deficiency is. Yes. But they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. And and that's that was part of the big problem. But, yeah. but they would recover quite quickly. And yeah. I think from some distance uh, down into the depths of their pain. Sorry about so, your gums, lack of teeth, and no connective tissue, but at least you're alive. There you go. Ugh. But, yeah. Let's go back to last week's episode. At least you're alive. I don't want to be. <laughs> don't, this I is don't dreadful. Don't. Put me in the sarco. Look, I'd take the sarco over that. Um, <sighs> Even I would. And I, you know, I'm anti-death. I think death is a mistake. So just about every every big explorer yeah. um, journey of like the fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth centuries, um, it was scurvy was dogging them like like nothing else. So Vasco da Gama, um, early early Portuguese explorer, went. Uh, he around, found the fountain of El Dorado youth, didn't he? Uh, he did hunt for gold in India. Uh, he got to India, so went around the Cape of Good Hope. A yep. um, hundred out of his hundred and sixty men crew died of scurvy. Oh, fuck me, the reek ship of death stink. Mm-hmm. I mean, and rattling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least, what 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 do you do? What what's the first giveaway they're coming? Is it the smell or is it the rattling noises? I don't of their know joints? which is further. Uh, a famous famous um, voyage was Commodore George Anson's uh, four year six boat circumnavigation of the world. Uh, he left with um, 1,800 crew. Came back with 1,795. No. Plus or minus? Came back with 188. That's less, right? So 90% of his crew died. Not all of them of scurvy, but um, 1,000 of them died, oh, uh, died of scurvy. It's like 60% died of scurvy. Yeah. A whole chunk more died because they had a, like a scurvyish pilot. Um, driving the boat, and he shipwrecked a boat while he was while he was. He thought the like, island was a roast chicken, oh, and he was really like nostalgic. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was um, shockingly high. So throughout uh, this time, uh, they just expected any long voyage, you're going to lose fifty percent of your crew, and it could be up to ninety percent. Anyway, want to come? <laughs> How many do you expect to lose? 40? Oh, this is why. And I was reading a bunch of these stories. Recruitment methods for the British Navy at the time, uh, I don't know if you've heard much of this, but they had this thing called a press gang. Yes. Uh, So they would just wander around the streets, find drunk people, press a coin into their hands, and that means you've accepted pay. Contract done. And then contract done, and then you're on the boat, and you wake up, you know, a day later on the boat out to sea. Blindingly hungover. Probably been cudgeled just to make sure you're compliant. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up in your own chunder and everyone else's. One historian said that throughout the age of explorers, scurvy killed more um, people at sea than anything else, than storms, shipwrecks, combat, all other diseases combined. Dragons? Dragons? Didn't include. Didn't include. See, they're afraid. They don't want you to know the truth. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, it it could be. Yeah. Uh, I don't know know what this is based on, but an estimated 2 million seamen during this time died during died because of scurvy. What sort of period, sorry? Two million over? Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Over You know, someone said period. two million. Yeah, over a Sounds period. huge. Period. It's nine times the over population a... of Great Britain at the time. It was a lot of people. Two million lot, is a lot of people. people. But, but I think the key one is that thing of 50% of the crew would just die. That's fucked up. So you got we got a boat. We need 40 people to run this boat. How many crew do you need? 80, maybe 90, just in case. Why? <laughs> no, just in case. Just to be sure. So you'll get a good rest. There was, um, you know, that George Anson's crew. Um, yeah. They couldn't get enough people to, to do that because there was a war going on at the time and he was going to do a, a sort of, he was doing distance bit of the war, you know, going around the ocean looking for Spanish or something like <sighs> that. And so they emptied an, um, an invalid hospital to crew his ships. So it was all, all people over already, 60 and so, yeah, yeah. Already yeah. invalid. Yeah, they're already invalid. And so they just dragged them out of the hospital, like 300, 300 old guys. They're like 60 or 70. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have scurvy? No. <laughs> Okay. Just, <laughs> what are the criteria? Do at least three quarters of your limbs work? Can you hear? 
I, one ear will do. I just, just the idea of being on a ship like that where it's staffed <sighs> by people that are all literally in an invalid hospital already. And uh, does invalid at that point mean you're basically there till you die? Is It's not a convalescent Possibly. Convalescence Possibly. Plan? I don't know. I don't know. Because invalid doesn't, like, it's not a strong recommendation for getting on that boat. Mm. It's crewed by invalids. I'm not joining. No. But you get to see the world. So it traveled around well, the world. Well, a, a and, percentage of it. And most of them died. Before you die. So you'll be surprised. Will I? Like all, all medical journeys throughout olden times. Medical journeys. They had, they had some um, cures that, that weren't what you would expect in the modern world. Did they? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to go through them all. Um, I don't mind. Uh, i got time. So the, the guys in the Crusades, um, yeah. they thought uh, scurvy was called, caused by eating eel um, during, <sighs> during Lent. During, during, during Lent, Lent. During Lent, you couldn't eat meat, so they ate eel, and then they got scurvy. So, so it wasn't it would have eating meat at all, but the eel was the only thing available. I Therefore, think so. Eel. I think so. So they blamed it on eel. It, spoiler, it wasn't eel. Was it? it? Eel wasn't causing it. Eel. In fact, eel, eel probably would do you good. Um, a lot of weird things have what you need for scurvy. I was surprised. It's, it's surprisingly- I've seen a few it's things. It's surprisingly like, common. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so as we said before, there's the people that were washing their um, their mouth out with the urine. Mm. Thought that would help. I think I think it's something to do with the gums, and they thought urine might be able to. Look, and to be fair, it's not going to do any harm. It's going to do other goods. If you want to know more about drinking your own urine, episode uh, mm, I love that oh, episode a while ago, and your favourite, uh, mercury, of course. I love mercury. Some some had the there was a guy called Francis Spillsbury. Um, uh-huh. He was selling Spillsbury drops, was he? Which were a combination of mercury and antimony, which is basically more mercury. Antimony. That's no. That's what um, Wolverine's made out of. No, he's not. Adamantium. No. It's it's yep. another it's another metal element that uh, mercuryesque. Yeah, it's very it's very. We're adding two metals here to what you get. But my favorite <sighs> my favorite wacky cure um, came from a guy. He was a um, an 18th century uh, sexologist from Scotland. Get down, 18th century sexologist. Yeah. What do you do, sexologist? Why gets me a lead? Well, one of the things he invented, and I'll come to, I'll come to his his um, scurvy cure in a second. Steam driven masturb- masturbation device. Please, 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 please. It's not too far off. Oh yes. He called it the celestial bed. I bet um, he did. It was it was a big bed like a twelve a prong for every orifice, <laughs> and an extra one for the weekend. Not far <laughs> off. Um, his wonder working edifice. He was trying to help mm-hmm. people conceive. It was mm-hmm. a big bed, twelve by nine feet. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a bit bigger than your king size bed. And it's got a big canopy over it, mm-hmm. um, covered in musical automata, fresh flowers, and a pair of live turtle doves. Uh, stimulating oriental fragrances and mm. ethereal gases were released from a reservoir inside the dome. Mm-hmm. A tilting inner frame put couples in the best position to yes. conceive. Yes. And their movements set off music from organ pipes, which breathed out celestial sounds. Their movements. Who, whose intensity increased with the ardor of the bed's occupants. So this is, this is 18th century. Per- <laughs> it's it's a bed the that doves die and shit on you. As you root harder, um, it, it makes music. Well, it makes noise. I'm 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 going to call music a bit of heavy lifting there. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know if you ever fucked on a piano. I know, I know a lot of people have. Indeed, yeah. What I'm not hearing when you're fucking on a piano, this is theoretical, <laughs> is music sound. Yes, it would be a talent. It yeah. would be, absolutely be a talent if you could manage to fuck and play a song. What with the fucking a concerto with four butt cheeks and two balls. <laughs> it's amazing. It's complicated, but it's worth it. Oh man. Oh. Um, anyway, so his cure, his, his cure of scurvy. You'll be surprised. He reckoned it cured a bunch of other things. I'm shocked. Um, shocked. Was called earth bathing. Um, so they bury you alive. Yes, not all of you. Uh. He said that long stints in the all-fostering bosom of our original mother, yes. and that he meant soil, mm. opened up the pores and leached toxins from the body. Did it. Earth bathing was considered good for many ailments, but was particularly effective for scurvy, mm-hmm. venereal disease, gout, rheumatism, a few other things. So, <laughs> uh, and also obesity. So he, he did a bunch of- Sure. I'm going to bury you, including your arms. <laughs> Bet you lose weight. Here's an, here's an article from the Times, uh, the London Times, yeah. 14th of October, 1791. Earth bathing. Dr. Graham, that was uh, Dr. James Graham, mm. is now at Sheffield, and he and a young woman on Wednesday and Thursday buried themselves up to the lips in earth. Top it, or bottom? 
got to be the bottom. Bottom lip. So you're allowed to breathe. Because well, he did lectures like this. So <laughs> so he and he and he and a, a woman um, would go up on stage, <laughs> strip down, and then sort of um, they'd go into these pits of, oh, that's of great. And, and then that's bur- great. bury themselves up to their lips. <clears throat> Is everybody sitting comfortably? Because I sure as hell are. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> There was a few people that you could go to um, mm. salons where they would pour earth on you, mm. um, but the the burying yourself to get the full earth be experience buried. and up to the lips. Look, I have an opportunity to rejig one of my courses next year, <laughs> and I'm thinking now, I, I you've given me what I need. Your squad goal you've is give me what's missing. Lecture while buried up to the lip. I don't know why you don't stop at the chin. No, nope, lip. <laughs> no, nope, that's because you've got to be committed. But I'm assuming too, if you're properly buried, the the moving of the jaw up and down would would be complex, or at least a little bit. There'd be a bit of resistance. Maybe they're uh, continually putting little bits of extra soil as you push it away, just filling up the mound of. Do they of tamp it soil. down? Squeeze you in. <laughs> so coming up to your bottom lip, fairly well tamped down. I feel like that would be. I don't, I don't know. Restrictive. So, so there's there's the gentleman getting poured some soil on him. Um, that's a that's a dude. Yeah, that, he's a round and. Look, robust young. Many many can be round and robust. No, but he's, he looks like a literal Botticellian here's some, cherub. Here's some ladies. Hey, and, and, and this is, this is cartoonish. Ladies. That's not her lips that are above the soil. No, that's her bosoms. Um, but she's got a nice hat on. She does. So. And her hands are in the air like she just don't care. So I'm, I'm really quite surprised that um, uh, 1790s, they were happy to strip off and, and bury buried. themselves in the dirt. There is a whole subset of dirty, dirty people, and I don't mean soil. Well, look, period. people people always always they liked have been. the nudes. People always have been, yep. but Jane Austen never mentioned it. It was all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> That's your go-to. Well, if it's not in Jane Austen, the thing is, sailors took on this theory. They were, they thought ah, there's something on there because there ain't no soil on a ship. So maybe we could do that. Bring um, soil because that's they, what a boat needs. They did. Wait, there there are people bringing soil to cure scurvy. There's, What's in your chest? <laughs> just four just ton of soil. Dirt. Four tons, and I've got one of them root beds with an organ. I wonder if you use it up, like if you bury yourself in the soil, oh, it leaches. does it uses use up all your all the leaching power or it, something? Yeah, like yeah, that. it loses its thingy, like a coffee filter. I do like every every night. Do you sneak down to your your box of soil and just oh, bury me. yourself? And um, also, I mean, boats of the era, yeah, not famously spacious. No, no, and there may have been a couple of other things you might want to take. Food. More soil. Shot. More soil. And more soil. <laughs> Cures to scurvy. Oh, um, fuck me. So there's there's a story of one of Anson, you know, the, the guy that circumnavigated the world. The aforementioned. Um, Is that what they called him? Anson yeah, the they, they got to an island or something like that, and he, he cut out a piece of turf and, and buried his mouth into the hole to, to try and eat the soil to fix this. What? Um, buried his mouth in yeah, order he, to he, eat? He, he ate the soil. He dug his mouth into the soil and just started eating dirt. Um Okay. Uh, Vitus Bering, a Danish navigator, he he was the one that the Bering Strait is named after. Oh. Um, he died of scurvy, half buried in the ground. So he got a, he got to an island, buried himself with the idea that this would help with the scurvy. It didn't. Alas, it did not. But here's the thing: while there's a whole bunch of our our wacky friends that are doing what they do, coming up with quack treatments for scurvy, mm. for pretty much the whole time, people have known the right treatment. Even then, uh, all the, all the way along, they knew or okay, they didn't know why it worked, but there have been people recommending treatments for scurvy as far back as we've got writing on scurvy. Right, okay. So okay, okay. Um, the Ebers Papyrus, fifteen hundred BCE, so yeah, three thousand five hundred years ago, it said, correct. "Hey, there's scurvy," and it also said, "You know what to do with this? Um, some onions, um, some onions." But they would have called it scurvathenos, possibly. So people would have missed it. So they used onions, and and there's other people that are using onion juice still. Oh, but did, did they eat them, or did they use onions, so to speak? Don't know. They're, uh, they're only curious to stick an onion up your nose and let it osmote. It's got to You know dissolve. there will be people that do that. Absolutely. I'll put, put it in your bum, because if it's something that you shouldn't do, <laughs> it's probably going to be better for you if you've got a weird disease. Obviously rectal. And whole, and you have to keep it in there until it's gone. That's how you cure scurvy. That's why sailors walk strangely. <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> it's one theory. It's one theory. Uh, what is it? Um, the fifth century Chinese monk um, that I said before. Mm. Nev. He said carry ginger 
when you're out on chips. That works too. Yeah, well, and they could grow ginger plants. Um, in the soil. In the, in the soil. That hey, guys, got. what if instead of burying people, right? There's actually, there's actually some stories of people growing quite a few things on ships and then the, the owners of the ship say, dude, the tree roots are actually destroying your ship. We, we can't do this anymore. It's so, unpreferable. Uh, Viking navigators. Yeah. So around the year 1000, they went to America. Yeah. Um, they carried barrels of cloudberries. That worked too. Um, there's a famous story in 1535, a uh, uh, French navigator landed in Canada. Mm-hmm. So not very long. They hadn't, uh, you know, Columbus was only 40 years earlier. Um, and this is his account. Landed in Canada and there a disease came upon the so- sailors. Their gums swelled up. They couldn't eat. Their teeth fell out. Their legs became purple and swollen. Many of them started hallucinating and dropped dead. So Sweet. Sounds s- familiar. Some locals also got the symptoms. I'm not sure why the locals got symptoms. Maybe it was, I think, I think it was during winter or something like that. Mm. And they cured themselves instantly with some juice extracted from a tree called an eater. They had known the cure for centuries. Um, uh, the French sailor, Jacques Cartier, he distrusted the locals so much that he thought the leaves were a plot to kill his men. Days became weeks, weeks uh, became months. More sailors fell sick. A bunch, a bunch died, got personality disorders. And then he's like, all right, let's try, the, let's try this medicine that the indigenous people are offering to us really nicely. That is clearly making them better as far as we can do. A bunch died and then got personality you could disorders. Watch, you could watch them eating it yeah. and they got better. And he's like, no, don't no, trust it. Plot. Don't, it's, it's, it's a plot. It's a plot. Uh, so he eventually tried it and they were all miraculously cured straight away. Unrelated. And he's like, no, he was Unrelated. like, <laughs> he's like, this is wild. Um, overdue at finding a cure for the deadly disease. Um, he documented his findings and went around telling the whole world, I don't know, how the Indians cured seafarers illness with pl- plant juice. Plant juice. He thought he would be hailed as a hero, but uh, it wasn't taken up that much further. Oh, because he identified with the indigenes and therefore was terrible? I don't know why, but... Uh, In 1601, the English naval surgeon James Lancaster uh, performed probably the first semi-scientific investigation. He had three ships, four ships. Um, In one of them, he he gave them lemon juice every morning. Yep. The others, he gave nothing. And the one with lemon juice, they did much better. Um, Less dead. Yeah. So there's a bunch of other stories throughout this time of people using a bunch of different things. Lemon juice comes up over and over again. So just juice. It doesn't matter what it is. Beef juice? Mm, beef juice Actually, would do it. probably work, yeah. Beef juice yeah. would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also there's other other things like um, the Dutch were using uh, scurvy grass and horseradish and watercress. They all would have worked. Um, the Swedish were using pine shoots in their beer. Pine shoots in their – I love that attitude. When you look around in this story, there's a bunch of traditional histories that say, oh, I was cured this way and cured yeah. that way. Yeah. They're not true at all. Like the, like the thing is, it, cures have been known for a very, very long time and people manage to forget it through, well, let's say bad science. Um, also. And then we rediscover it again. That's, is it bad science or is it just people, I suspect. Yeah. Disapproval of certain groups who do things leads to you not doing the things from the groups of whom you disapprove. I think that could be the same as what I said. Quincequently? Yes. You don't. It could be that. It, it's it, it's a big tr- distrust of where the evidence comes from. Yeah. Um, I suppose that is bad science. Okay, maybe you're right. I don't like that. So things started to change. <clears throat> He's from, handsome. With James Lind. Yes, hey James. you're a handsome gentleman here. Yeah. Uh, he, was, he wasn't the first person at all to recommend uh, citrus juice um, to cure scurvy. Um, and even when he did, he wasn't very good at it. But anyway, he did, he, <laughs> he did something new. And invented the clinical trial. So he was born in Edinburgh in 1716. Uh, he joined the Navy at 15 as a surgeon's mate um, and then was sort of at sea for constantly for eight years oh. um, in the Channel, the Mediterranean, the West Indies. Well, wow. He became the surgeon um, on the HMS Salisbury. And before it sailed for, um, in December 1746, 47, sorry, uh, he decided to do, let's do a trial. Let's, let's try some different things to see what actually helps with scurvy. Um, he got 12 sailors that were sick, uh, divided into them six groups of two. So two sailors each in each group yep. and gave them a bunch of different cures. Uh, so he'd give them the normal diet. Dirt. No dirt. Sadly, no dirt. They, they'd moved on from dirt by this time. No burying. Okay. No, no dirt. No. So no. things could plausibly be treatments. Yeah. Things that they thought might be. Right. So, okay. um, one got a quart of cider every day. Uh, That'll, that should be fine. It'd probably be nice. Another group got 25 drops of sulfuric acid. Uh, every, oh, 
To eat. Three times a day. Yeah, you just have 25 drops of just have. sulfuric acid. Uh, they won, right? They, they were the, the most cured. They really thought at this time that acid was the key thing. Um, oh, well, the citrus link, I get that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, another group got two spoonfuls of vinegar. So he, what he's doing, he's, mm. trying, he's trying the best types of acid to, to work on scurvy. And sulfuric. Another group, <laughs> uh, another group got half a pint of seawater. Ah, fuck off. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Drink it. No. I. But you agreed. I would find oh. it so hard to drink half a pint of seawater. I think my mouth just, just. I mean, look, it's only about 300 mils or something, but still. I mean, even you're in the ocean. It's a nice fresh beach. You're happy. And someone says, deliberately take a gulp. And you're like, I, I don't, I really, I, I, don't, I really I, don't want to. My worry. body does not want to do that. I, no, that's not a cure. Uh. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, not that one. Uh, what, what else have I got? Oh, spicy paste. Ooh. I, I don't know what was in it. I think there was some nutmeg and tamarind or something like that. But he just, Delightful. He just got a bunch of things, sort of pounded them up, made a little spicy paste thing. Eat, eat the smoosh. <laughs> does it seem tangy? Yes, it does. <laughs> How do you feel? There you go. Tangy might have hurt. And the last group got two oranges and a lemon every, uh, every day. They ran out of orange and lemons on day six, but happily, cool. group six- the orange and lemon group had already yeah. um, they were already back at work, like they'd recovered that quickly. And I don't know how bad they were. I don't know if they yeah, were yeah, teeth yeah. falling out stage, um, oh. but they recovered straight away. And so this is often hailed as the moment when scurvy was cured, but it wasn't. But it's not so much. Anyway, the first thing um, scientifically cured. Uh, no. Esque. No. Not. No. No. Well, no, no, the first thing. Um, so he did this in he he quit the navy. And then he went to write his giant, his giant book, Treaties on Scurvy, uh, containing an inquiry into the nature, causes, and cure of that disease, together with a critical chronological view of what has been published on the subject. That was the title? Long title, you know. Imagine that, yeah. Seven-paragraph um, title and the book, one page. But he's got, he's got like this brand new study. No one's ever done it. And no. he, he buries that back on page 200 um, of this 400-page book. Fuck, the ability to add words is quite remarkable. Well, here's the sentence where he says the key result. Okay, you take a breath. As I shall have occasion elsewhere to take notice of the effects of other medicines in this disease, I shall here only observe that the results of my experiments was that oranges and lemons were the most effectual remedies for this distemperate sea. So he has said they were the most effective. But the proclivity to start with everything that doesn't matter. It's buried. It's every so buried. fucking sentence starts with a whole bunch of extra garbage and then the point. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, the the thing is, it was mostly ignored. Like the navy just went, no, nah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think no one read it. Buried on page two hundred yeah. in a sentence that starts with a whole bunch of caveats or, or background. It's not really ignored. It's just missed. He didn't do very much work pushing it either. Oh, that, and, would, that and, wouldn't help. Yeah. And there's a there's a really sad story where some people said he might have just been way too humble. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a sad story later in life when he was a member of a naval board that awarded a five thousand prize for someone for a, a, a still that could turn salt water into uh, fresh water that he himself had invented 20 years earlier. So And he just quietly watched. He just quietly went, yes, that's, that's great. That's great. Uh, he, what he, the fuck? He'd invented it and yet he still gave the prize out or the, the board did and they're just like, fuck off, Lindy. Shut oh, up. You again. Shut up. You didn't you're, invent You're going to write 900 words on that too, mate? Come on, let's see how many words you can write about getting salt out of water. So that's ridiculous. So this is this is sort of people are starting to work towards a cure here, uh, 1747. But the navy didn't pick it up. No one really paid much attention. Yeah. Um, Twenty years later, when Captain Cook um, started his sailing around the world, he didn't really include lemons or oranges in his anti scurvy treatment. So he didn't. He didn't Why pay. would he? Why would he? Yeah. No. Not twenty at all. years later, you say. Uh, yeah. Twenty years okay. later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he took what's called McBride's malt, which is like um, uh, I think it's a bit a uh, malt beer or something like it's not uh, or the wort from a beer. You, you do homebrew? Oh, fuck, you don't want to drink what's left. Yeah, that's it. That drink drink what's left. Have you seen what's left? Is it gross? Ooh, ooh. But that's it, what they were using. It looks like liquid fungal evil. Like, it's not great. You, and it doesn't smell good. You can tell it's related to beer, mm -hmm. but you can also see it is emphatically not beer. But it's a multi version. True, at least it's sweet. <laughs> so he tried that, Ugh. and he tried sauerkraut, and he, and he tried- okay. Portable vegetables. Uh, no, portable soup, sorry. I don't know what. I was going to say, I think most vegetables are fairly portable ultimately, but yeah, okay, portable soup. But also importantly, he took every chance that he could to, to grab um, fresh vegetables yeah. from islands and things like that, yeah. and he tried to keep them as fresh as he could, um, yeah. okay. uh, uh, washed or stored between layers of fruit. Um, yeah. 
and, and in fact, it's really weird. He's so often held up, Captain Cook, as, as conquering scurvy. The man. Um, he came back and he's, and, and people, you know, often attribute this to the sauerkraut and he didn't, he didn't say that at all. Mm. He said, um, that, uh, oranges and lemons are too expensive to, to use. Yeah. I recommend the malt, the, the wort, McBride's wort rather than lemon juice, um, to, to use. So. I'm not going to argue that it doesn't work. I'm going to argue that if you put a pint of that and a pint of seawater in front of me, it would take me a long time to decide which one I was going to do, and I, I still don't know. Neither of them work. Uh, seawater does not work. Uh, and, I'm shocked. And the malt does not work. The either. malt didn't work. So okay, no, it didn't. Uh, so he's, it's so it's such a weird thing that uh, Cook is often held as conquering scurvy, mm. but his advice to other people was literally bad advice, and he he did keep scurvy down on his boats. Not. Keep it away, but uh, sounds a bit like by accident, was it? Uh, he thought he was doing something else. I think so. It's the fact that they picked up lots of vegetables and used vegetables as much as they could, but also um, drink this seawater. He didn't drink seawater. But anymore. you know, what I mean, it's like okay, we need vegetables for other. Now drink this horrible malt wort bullshit. Is that a better beer? It's it's, it's a, better, a better beer, it's a isn't it? Yeah, it's a better beer. Thank you, Akasha Project. You're very good. But gradually. People started to pay a bit more attention. Yeah. Uh, so you get uh, in the 1760s, you get some French um, doctors who are saying that's good, but their their naval administrators said no, no, we're not going to we're Imagine. not going to do the lemon juice. The French are not renowned um, for bureaucracy getting in the way. You get some some guy William Northcote. Yeah. He accepted that scurvy might be something to do with lack of fresh fruit and vegetables, um, and he recommended you know maybe we take a, a quintessence of oranges and lemons um, on uh, on board with you. Just the zest. Just the zest, just the, zest. just the spicy bit. But people are still selling the stuff like the Spillsbury drops, the mercury, and there's still a lot of quack cures going on. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but things really started to turn with with two key events. Yeah. One was a siege of Gibraltar for the British Navy in 1780, mm. which led to dreadful ravages of scurvy until they captured a boatload of oranges and lemons coming from Malaga. And oh, that's the so, place to get your citrus. Well, it's just coming past, and they're like, "Quick, capture that Spanish let's, fruit! Let's try fuck that. yeah!" And then they mix the the Spanish orange and lemons with uh, what was it, five to ten gallons of brandy with sixty gallons of lemon juice, and doled that am- out amongst the troops, and a liter of mercury. <laughs> just just to no be sure. mercury, Chuck no mercury, in. and suddenly they're like, "Hey, that kind of that kind of worked really well." Look at no one losing their teeth. And then uh, Sir Gilbert Blaine came along, mm. and. What he, he, he had that uh, James Lind didn't, James Lind was poor and unassuming. Gilbert Blaine uh, was a knight and, uh. um, and he got uh, really close with an admiral and then he brought some uh, econometric data. Okay. So he trained as a medical doctor. Yep. Um, and then he became personal physician to Admiral Rodney, who was a famous Admiral. Admiral Rodney. So he went by his first name. That's very gangster. I think, I think that was his last name. I, I don't know. It might have been Rodney Rodney. No, no, um, no one's the last name's Rodney. He accompanied the Admiral on a trip to the West Indies to, uh, to help treat his gout while he was going. Okay. And then while he's doing it, he's like, why don't, why don't you keep some, um, some records of, uh, all of your sailors Kooky. and all of your diagnoses and, and what happens to them? So he starts tabulating it all. And okay. he's like one in seven mm-hmm. of the sailors of your squadron has died of scurvy. 1500 people had been killed by scurvy, only 59 killed by the enemy. Uh, the number of deaths that you've got here would man three more ships. So you're losing a lot of people here. And they're suddenly like, oh, okay. Okay, now it matters. Then, yep. then he cal- calculated how much would that cost in oranges or limes. He's like, um, every 50 oranges or lemons might be considered the equivalent of a, of a human in the Navy. 50. So 50. Because that will, sa- that will save a life in general or save that many lives. Are you going to tell me how much that is? Because, I mean, for us now, 50 oranges, you're like, that. that's – I feel like that's a bit less than a human life. I, don't know. I was, looking, I was looking this morning at Coles and you can uh, big bag big bag of oranges, three kilos for I think it was eight dollars or something like that. So Yeah, I feel like a human life's worth at least twenty four. Forty oranges. Yeah, so forty oranges, two back, lemons. Back then the only way to get an orange is to <laughs> raid a Spanish ship. I love this is this is the um the attitude to human life in the Navy oh, at the time. Yeah. That yeah, fifty oranges or lemon, that's the equivalent of a man. That, that's and you can imagine them sitting around going, hang on, we've got mm, to think about this. Get the calculator, mm, tabulate this shit. Mm. Uh, so eventually they had the, they, they had the numbers. Yep. They had the numbers. They knew, oh, if you can get the oranges and lemons. Yep, yep. So, um, so they got the numbers, and in 1796 the Sick and Hurt Commission 
uh, agreed to supply all Navy ships on foreign service with lemon juice. Okay. Um, and in 1799, uh, all ships along the British coast. They, they went hard in for this because the Napoleonic Wars started there, the Wars of the French Revolution. And um, I, I hear those were significant. Between 1795 and 1814, the Admiralty issued 1.6 million gallons of lemon juice. Sweet lemons were imported, especially from the Mediterranean region. Oh, uh, Lord gosh. Nelson turned Sicily into a vast lemon juice factory. <laughs> um, they, they say that um, it was possible then for the British Navy to blockade French ports for years at a time. So they just parked the boats yeah. outside the ports, um, blocking the Napoleonic power um, because lemon juice made that uh, possible. Because they didn't waste away and die. Waste away and die of scurvy. Um, of, okay. Some people reckon of all the means which defeated Napoleon, lemon juice and the car- carronade gun were the two most important we talk about the gun now? I don't know what the gun is. I, I didn't look into the gun. So but sad. just the, but, but they yeah. were really stressing the idea that lemon juice yeah. is how we won this war because it allowed us to blockade these ports. And Isn't that maybe, funny? It, it's always something dumb, like edible shoelaces, boom, that's how we beat the Canadians. I don't know. You, you know you know the story. It's as old as time. I mean, it'd be a great war story if edible shoelaces were suddenly. I'll tell you next week. But the weird thing is, you know, they, they literally did. They cured scurvy in their fleet. Yeah. Um, and for the next hundred years – they basically never really had scurvy at all in their fleet. But see, like in any sport, you shouldn't you, – getting rid of your unforced errors is really important and letting your own troops die before the enemy kills them is a pretty big unforced error. I think that's what so you want I'm, to minimize. I'm on the team. I'm on team lemon juice now. But then this is so weird that they had scurvy cured and then something happened and they forgot about it. So a couple of things happened yep. uh, throughout the 19th century. So they started with a working cure. They had, they had an effective cure for scurvy mm. that meant the British could uh, keep, a, keep a boat outside a French port for years on end, just sitting there, not doing anything, but they could stop them from dying of scurvy. Now, yeah. previously, yeah. it'd be like a three-month voyage and you'd start to get people dying of scurvy, but not anymore. What a boring job in the Navy, though. What do you do? Sit in a boat and that's it. Drink lemon juice. <laughs> no more mercury, though. I'm a bit disappointed. Could I, could I wait a little bit till I get the hallucinations, then yeah, sort of yeah, dial yeah. it back? Let's, I just... let's enjoy the party. But no, sit there, drink lemon juice, look at the French. So the first thing that happened is um, in 1845, um, the governor of Bermuda, so British colony at the time, uh, said, hey, let's let's grow, um, grow them down here in Bermuda. I can grow limes uh, rather than lemons uh, down here and we'll keep it in the colony, so in the empire. So it'll be a little bit a lot better. <laughs> and so they thought, okay, rather than coming from Sicily, uh, which we have to – it's not our territory, we can keep it all in the family here. Well, that makes sense. So they switched from lemons from Sicily to limes from the West Indies. You'd think that sounds the same, but weirdly, yeah. Um, then when they were, they were uh, getting them from uh, Bermuda, mm. they'd ship them to Liverpool, uh, boil them, bottle them, and move the lime juice out to the out to the navy here. Boy, why do the British love to boil everything before they put it in their mouths? Like literally, boy, I'm going to boil it. They, they boil their pipes. <laughs> Just don't boil everything. You, it might be part of the problem here. Not all food needs boiling. Then also, yeah. ships got faster and faster and faster. Yeah. So a lot of people have talked about this, and they literally did have a cure for scurvy uh, in the Napoleonic times. They were um, taking lemon juice mm. in, in a couple of spoonfuls every day, getting it from Sicily, which was right nearby, and it worked. It was a cure. Over the next 100 years, boats got faster mm-hmm. and they switched to limes and they, and they had more ports that they went into. So what a lot of people have argued is they actually lost their cure. And the fact was that they, they didn't spend as long at sea. So a couple of hundred years earlier. They, so less important. Yeah, th- this is the thing. A couple right, hundred right, years right, right, earlier, right. you could go yeah, for this yeah. four-year journey around the world. But suddenly, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, you could sail between ports all the time, pick up new fresh fruits and vegetables, all sorts of things like that. two and a half years now. I mean, what's the fuss? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, yeah, okay. No, not, yeah. not you, know, you know, so they weren't at sea nearly as long. Yeah, okay. Um, and so- it Became less important. It became less important to have a cure. And the point is, okay. then they stopped actually noticing that their cure didn't work. So- <laughs> So in 1875, um, they started to do a bunch of Arctic and Antarctic expeditions. Uh, Napoleon? Not Napoleon. 1875, Vice Admiral Sir George Strong Nares. Fuck yes. Okay, I've now finally decided what to change my name to. (laughs) 
Just Strong. Sir George Strong. They gave him a job to um, to reach the North Pole via Greenland. Uh, some this is this is the sort of time when they thought there would be an open polar sea, or um, you could go along the Green uh, Greenland coast and get uh, across to the Pacific. Give us time. Anyway, um, they said take a sledging party, see how far north you can get. A sledging party. I yeah. should I should be in a sledging party. Fucking love sledging. It's just, yeah, isolates. Oh, different. Yeah, but the expedition was a fiasco. Um, <laughs> as soon as they got off the boat. Um, two of the men in the sledging party developed scurvy within days of leaving the ship. Really? Within five weeks, half the men were sick, and despite having laid depots with plentiful supplies for their return journey, they were barely able to make it back. Damn. A rescue party sent to intercept them found that the lime juice, so they brought the lime juice Uh, that the Navy had been using, uh, um, failed to have its usual dramatic effect. Uh, Flawed lime juice? All of the people that stayed on the ship waiting for them and took their daily dose, yeah. also got scurvy. So suddenly, they've uh, gone like 100 years where we're not getting scurvy, but they start to do something different, and they go, holy shit. So is it the boiling? This is, this is not a cure anymore. Yeah. So <sighs> what had happened in that time is that limes are, have, are far less effective than lemons, even though, even really? though they thought they were more really? effective. But then any t- anytime you start boiling things uh, – Things disappear. Things disappear. And they, here, did, they didn't eat notice. Eat your boiled vegetables. Are peas normally grey? Yes, they are. So this 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 um, perplexed the Navy. They're like, what the hell? This but is- we boiled it. Yeah, exactly. We made it stronger what by boiling it. What is wrong with you? We, we ma- boiled we, it. We made it more. Did you see the bo- steam coming off? Steam is weakness leaving the food. <laughs> literally. Come literally. on. So there are so many stories here of boiling as, as the cure. There was, I- <laughs> <laughs> see, see how it changed colour? You know how they were vibrant green and now they're just grey? Grey's good. This is what they thought. They thought if you get lemon juice and you boil it down to it's stronger. A, a rob of lemons, stronger. There was another one. Oh, this is boiling. I didn't get this quite into it. There was um, a lot of <laughs> a lot of scurvy in the American Civil War. Yeah. And they, <laughs> the cure that they had was what was it called? Um, compressed desiccated vegetable cake or something like that. They 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 had this vegetable cake that needed to be boiled for six hours before you could eat yeah, it. Yeah, that's how you get the goodness out. Everyone knows that. Look, that, this is what I do too. Is like I want a vegetable stir fry. But before you fry it, boil for boil six it for hours. a day. Jesus Christ. Pour the gooey residue into the fry pan. Uh. <laughs> add coriander. Yeah, so. Fucking boiling. Um, so suddenly they had an inquiry um, in the British Navy at a parliamentary inquiry at the um, in the 1770s. And they're just perplexed. They're like, citrus juice doesn't work, even though we've been using it for a hundred years. And the title of the report, but we boiled it. (laughs) The Navy sadly admitted, there is no question of doubt that we have not, in lime juice, the true preventative of scurvy. Yes, it's the lime juice's fault. Wasn't that long ago, long after, that they figured out what was happening. So the riddle was solved by pure luck. Mm -hmm. So 1907... Axel Holst and Theodore Froelich in Oslo were studying a similar disease to scurvy, beriberi. Uh, they were studying oh, yeah, it in yeah. pigeons, yeah. and they thought, oh, let's switch to a mammal model. And just by pure luck, they chose guinea pigs. Pure luck, because there's three animals that can't generate vitamin C. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've, yeah, this rings a bell. Yep, okay. It's us yep. and monkeys. And guinea pigs. And so just by pure luck, the obvious three. They, they fed the, the guinea pig a pure grain diet. So no, yeah. no vegetables, yeah. no, no meats, no anything like that. It's just pure grain. And the animal didn't show any signs of beriberi, but very quickly sickened and died in a way that resemble, resembled pretty much human scurvy. Oh, so they're like, that's gross. so weird. They had never seen uh, scurvy in an animal before. Okay. Um, but they, to be fair, they probably never looked either. So um, a few years later, Casimir Funk of the Lister Institute classified beriberi, scurvy, and rickets as three different deficiency diseases, all lacking the organic basis of what he called vitamins. Different vitamins, yeah. Vi- different yeah. vitamins. Yeah. So, so basically um, over that peer- period, they, they established that there was some sort of vitamin that is lacking when people don't have scurvy. And it was just, it was just luck that um, they chose the guinea pig because here's the thing. Wait, can I – so this guy came up with the vitamin idea? Uh, or this is sort of funk. No, this is where vitamins came up. He was vitamin guy. He's vitamin guy. Is it funky? Vitamins. Uh, it doesn't have any. Vitamins. Possibly. Do you have any vitamins? 
Okay, okay. Something, okay. That's good timing because vitamins in itself is a bizarre story. Well, it's something interesting in the sense of oh. vitamins is that um, – because we can't generate it, yeah. but just about every animal can, and heaps and heaps of plants do, uh, they couldn't actually find it because it was so hard to isolate. It was in just about everything. <sighs> this, this is the thing. They couldn't yeah, find right, the, right, right. what it was that would cure uh, different people because it was everywhere. Everywhere yeah. they looked, they, they found it. And so there's nothing to say, oh, this is unique about The one thing we didn't lemon consider juice was like we don't have it, whatever it is. But. Wow. It decays, and this is why we need to eat it regularly. You don't need a whole whole bunch of it. It, no. de- it decays in the body. We use it up, yeah. but also it decays in fresh fruit or or vegetables or by boiling it. So the more that you cook something, uh. you, you destroy your your vitamin C. And so if you're <laughs> if you're a long time at sea, then all of the the vitamins or the vitamin C out of whatever it is slowly disappear. So this is why lemons worked. Lemons definitely have vitamin C. They have twice as much vitamin C as um, as limes. Yeah. Uh, there are other things that have more vitamin C. Uh, but when they're outside the French ports, um, they could get the lemons from Sicily. Not very far. They're still pretty fresh. Still chock-a-block with vitamin right, C. Right, 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 right. Coming from the Caribbean, the limes had half the amount of vitamin C already. You're right. Then they'd sail them across, up the Atlantic up to Liverpool – Boil, Boil the them, fuck out of them. And okay. particularly in copper copper pots. Good idea. Copper made it worse. You know why? Because they ran out of lead pots. <laughs> and they, they so all of the things that they did actually destroyed the the working ingredients, um, the, the destroyed the vitamin C. Uh, okay. So it didn't work. But it was just masked by the fact that they weren't doing the same sorts of things. They weren't doing these slow, long ocean voyages. <sighs> And so they didn't know what was uh, what was causing it at all. They thought that they had a yeah, whole yeah. bunch of theories of what they thought was causing it. They thought it might have been a putrefaction of of the inside organs or something like that. It took a long time to work out. It was just deficiency, and it was just fruit and vegetables. But what a wacky constellation of like related variables that weren't clearly related. That's amazing. So that's amazing. You no, know, but the thing is, people had known for centuries. It's fresh fruit and vegetables. Like this, it was a you know in all of those sailors' accounts and all of the you know the ancient accounts. You know, carry your cloud berries or something like that. Eat a carrot, idiot. And in their defense, it's um, it's when you're going further. It's it's um, when you go for a long time, it's hard to keep it in those fresh fruits and vegetables because they decay. They yeah, rot yeah, yeah, and okay, the vitamin okay. C. So goes. assumption also is that the more ancient ones with the more, uh, I don't know, dubious technologies weren't doing the long trips at least That's on it. the water. That's it. Um, so – uh, when they when they looked at when they discovered this, they looked at the British Army and the Royal Navy's lime juice that they were still using at the time, and and they did a test and it had no vitamin C and they're like it's not actually working. It's just that we but, don't need it so much. Anymore. But we boiled it, boiled it. But we boiled it in 1928. Alexander sent Yogi. He isolated uh, the anti anti scurvy substance. He called it first hexaronic acid yeah. and then ascorbic acid. Ascorbic, yeah. Than vitamin C. I like ascorbic. So it's not clear if um, if Scott uh, in the Antarctic actually had scurvy. There's a lot of people that are debating what's going on, but the symptoms seem to line up. What are the competing theories though? Like, what else do they think he had? Exhaustion and and cold and, no, and fair. freezing fair. to death. No, I, I can see exhaustion because when I'm really tired, my legs do change colour. Mm. I mean, you probably noticed this yourself. Teeth fall out. Yeah, absolutely. It's like fuck. I'm tired. But I think I think that there is some of the wounds not healing, and uh, it's it's probably it's probably the fact that he had early stage scurvy deficiency. Yeah, okay. Because they weren't dealing, they weren't they weren't getting any vitamin C. It's known that they weren't, and it was making everything that they were doing harder. But the thing that blows my mind That's is that the guy that raced against him, Amundsen, he he was the guy that got to the South Pole first, and what they decided to do is eat fresh penguin. They wouldn't cook it. Uh, no, cooked penguin is awful, but fresh no, penguin is delicious. He, Do you know what's better than fresh penguin? Live penguin. He described it. He described it as really the most delicious steak ever. Um, some people said, "Man, oh. he's just the guy that tries wacky things just for just to do it." Um, wouldn't wouldn't you though? So what they used to do is they they discovered that the penguins liked music, 
And so, <laughs> so literally, they would play a trumpet. Um, a fucking to, trumpet. They would play a little, <laughs> They're going to play Ravelli. They would play a trumpet to a little tune. The penguins would start to dance. And then they murder them. And No, they didn't murder them. They would tie them up. Like they've got a little leash. Oh, God. Around, they, they've got a little leash around their feet. And then they had a little flock of penguins that- um, They'd they could murder one at a time. Murder one at a time. Eat fresh. Eat a penguin. Uh, it's penguin yeah. sashimi. Uh, fresh while you're going across Antarctica. Scott, you know what they say though, a penguin a day. I mean, that, that's a. Now that I know the uh, what happens after that image that you've just showed me, <laughs> sickening. Scott had a terrible time in Antarctica. Did he? Yeah, they died horrible deaths. But Amundsen got to the South Pole. Fucking fabulous. Got back. They gained weight. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? Oh, bleh. so oh, many, oh, so many penguin, penguins. <laughs> So there you go. Would you eat penguin? Yeah, sure. I, I'm happy yeah, to. I'm happy to eat most things if it's if it's prepared by someone that knows what they're doing. I'm going to Antarctica in a couple of months. I know there are I, a lot I, of penguins. I feel no. Look, if I'm quick, maybe I can grab one. I, I wouldn't be the one that does that. We were in Tasmania recently, and they've got uh, little little uh, fairy penguins, and they're, they're delicious. Oh my god, they're, they're beer bottle sized, and they're the most adorable little animal in the world. And I would feel like. You'd have to be an intense carnivore to not think I am the most murdery, murdering person. Ever eaten quail? Uh, yes. Have you okay. seen quails live? Adorable. Their eggs are like tiny little sugar Easter eggs. Like even eating the egg would make you feel like a mangler. I do like I do like animals that you can get into your mouth in one go. Then I feel like a giant. We're talking eating still, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just making sure.